Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Animesh Singh, and this is my colleague, Tommy Lee. Uh, together, we work for IBM Cloud and Containers Developer Technology Group. And today, we are here to talk about how you can build resilient and fault-tolerant microservices uh, leveraging Istio. Now, before I go into uh, some of the details, how many people are actually using uh, Service Mesh or Istio here? Very few. Uh, I, I didn't see uh, any hands raised, in fact. So I think uh, it will make sense to actually you know, go back and talk a bit about the motivation of the project, et cetera, what led to it. Uh, but essentially, uh, in 2014, there was a reactive manifesto which came out. Uh, more than 20,000 people have signed it. If you haven't read it, I would highly encourage go and read it. Um, very nice read. Uh, but the key theme there was that today's application demands can simply be not met by yesterday's application architectures. Essentially, today what we want are systems which are responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. Now, if we focus on the resiliency piece of this, what it says is they are significantly more tolerant of failure. And when failure does occur, they actually meet it with elegance rather than disaster. That's essentially uh, one of the true characteristics uh, for a cloud-native application. Typically, during the same time, microservices revolution was happening. Uh, it started somewhere around that same time frame. And essentially, as we are all aware, you take a monolithic application, break it down into single functions, which are typically around business capabilities. And you have small teams which are actually developing, maintaining, and deploying those microservices. Now, typically, microservices are encapsulated inside containers. There is a one-to-one -one relationship uh, most of the times. Everyone's container journey starts with one container, and it's easy in the beginning. Uh, but soon, the growth becomes overwhelming. We need container and microservices management. Enter Container Orchestrator. Now, if you look at a survey which was done uh, last year where we asked respondents what are they expecting most from a container orchestrator, scheduling, cluster management, and discovery were the top three functionalities identified. Now, if you look at the container stack, and all the layers, definitely popular container orchestrators like Kubernetes, Swarm, Meso, they actually sit at layer uh, five of this. We are all aware of the Kubernetes architecture. Any interaction we do uh, with Kubernetes through our UI, CLI, API goes to Kubernetes master. And then we have slave nodes, which are essentially responsible for running your uh, workloads. Uh, they actually run the kubelet, kubeproxy, Docker daemons, and they are then serving your workloads on top of those slave machines. Within IBM, we have our own IBM Cloud Container Service, which is based on Kubernetes. Uh, we manage, it's a managed service, so we manage the Kubernetes master, it's single tenant. The slave nodes are actually managed by the customer. We do provide triggers for OS updates, patches regarding hypervisor, Docker daemon, et cetera, and customers can actually scale up and down based on their need. We actually use the logging and monitoring data from the slave nodes to provide the management, but we don't have any access to the persistent data which is residing on customer's cluster. What we did was we actually also created a lot of developer patterns uh, to show how Kubernetes and microservices work great together. So they are essentially on ramps to technology, uh, and they actually help developers be productive with cloud, data, and AI. You can actually find a lot of our developer patterns on developer.ibm dot com slash code slash patterns, and anything you need with um, getting started with the technology, be it the architecture diagram, step-by-step -step instructions, the actual code in the GitHub repo, uh, it's all there. So some of the microservices pattern we created for all the Java and Spring Boot fans out here, how can you actually run Spring Boot microservices on top of a Kubernetes cluster? In addition, in this particular pattern, we also show how can you use functions using uh, the very popular open source OpenWhisk, which is part of the Apache Foundation. There is another Java EE framework, uh, which is becoming quite popular, which is MicroProfile. Uh, it's being backed by Red Hat, IBM, Fujitsu, and others. And we'll talk uh, in bit detail about this particular uh, MicroProfile microservices framework. So there is a developer pattern to actually use that. And if you're in a polyglot land where you actually are having microservices written in multiple languages, there is a pattern to get you started there as well. So what we see is Kubernetes is great for microservices. Do we need anything else? And that's a question uh, a lot of people were asking. 
Kubernetes and microservices already uh, handle a lot of your use cases. Now, what we saw on that slide was the top three functionalities which a container orchestrator gives you, scheduling, cluster management, and discovery. But is that enough? We need to build fully reactive and resilient microservices. And for that, we need mechanisms to actually avoid fault. So that means when you are doing canary testing, A-B testing, rolling out new versions, you need to be able to selectively route traffic. You need fault isolation so that you have ways to create circuit breakers, you are enforcing bulkheads, et cetera. Detect faults when they do happen. For that, you need great metrics capability. And then if failure does happen, you are able to recover from it in a graceful manner. In short, what we need is strong visibility, fault tolerance, traffic control, and a way to enforce security and policies. Enter service mesh. So what essentially is a service mesh? A way to think about it is, uh, think of it as a network of devices. So essentially you have a network in your data center which is connecting two machines. In this case, instead of connecting two machines, you are connecting a couple of microservices together. And all the tasks which typically the routers and the switches would handle, that's all offloaded to the service mesh. Now how do you actually build a service mesh? And your sidecars. So sidecars actually are gatekeepers which actually sit within your pod along with your microservice, and they are responsible for intercepting every incoming and outgoing traffic. And because they are able to do that, they also provide you rich routing, load balancing, plus they're collecting a lot of data which they can pass to the metrics systems. Istio essentially is an implementation of the service mesh launched earlier in the year. IBM, Google, and Lyft came together. And if you look at the architecture of Istio, Essentially, three key components are there. Pilot, which is actually responsible for configuring Istio deployments and ensuring that all these configurations are propagated to all the components in the system. All the routing and resiliency rules which we create, they actually go in Istio Pilot. Mixer, which is responsible for policy decisions like ACLs, rate limiting, authorization, etc. Mixer is also actually responsible for giving you the dashboards which give you the great metrics capability. And then finally, proxy, which is essentially the sidecar, which is the heart of the service mesh architecture that is based on Envoy, and it mediates all the inbound and outgoing traffic, and it's responsible for enforcing all the policy decisions, all the routing decisions, load balancing decisions. When your application does get deployed, this is how it looks. You have Istio control plane with all these components, and then finally your Istio data plane, uh, which is essentially hosting your application. Uh, Taking a bit more into the architecture, as I said, all the traffic entering and leaving is being intercepted by Envoy. Uh, Envoy essentially is a layer seven proxy which was developed by Lyft, very high performance proxy, uh, able to actually handle up to five million requests per second. That's essentially the heart of this. You then have ingress proxy, which is the gateway to your application. Uh, you can actually use Envoy for that as well. A lot of people actually use their Kub uh, Kubernetes ingress controllers. And then Nginx also announced they have added support now, so you can use uh, Nginx instead of Envoy. And all these different protocols, gRPC, HTTP2, HTTP1, they are all supported um, by Istio currently. So how do we make microservices uh, resilient with Istio? So let's see the capabilities which Istio is providing. Traffic control and visibility. Let's go into them a bit. So for example, when you are rolling out a new version of your microservice, all right, you don't want to redirect all the traffic to that. You want to selectively control. In this case, a rule like just send 1% of the traffic to this new version will actually ensure that if there is some fault in your new version, you can actually roll it back in a timely manner. You can steer the traffic based on the content, based on whether the user is using an iPhone or an Android, or a particular browser, or the request is coming from a particular geographic location, you can steer it to a particular version of your microservice. Then I talked about visibility, which is essentially the key. How do you actually look what's going into your service mesh? So Istio comes by, def by default with Grafana, uh, with Prometheus backend, as well as Zipkin, which actually gives you consistent uh, metrics across the whole uh, fleet of microservices which you have deployed. Essentially, uh, since Envoy is intercepting every incoming and outgoing traffic, it's also able to uh, store that data and be able to transfer that data to Mixer, which is based on a plugin-based architecture. And Prometheus and Grafana 
There are actually uh, plugins for this, and you can actually bring your own dashboard uh, into this mix. And definitely Zipkin, which gives you the request tracing capabilities, and which is very important. You are able to look at, uh, look at the source of the request. You are able to look into the request headers. You can see which services are lagging, which are slow. All that information you can get from the Zipkin dashboard. So around the same time Istio was launched, we launched a developer pattern. Uh, how can you actually manage microservices traffic using Istio on Kubernetes? So we took the sample book info application, but we also, what we did was we added a relational database component to it. Uh, when the sample application came out, uh, it was a static application, everything was being written to the local file system. So what it allowed us to do was, A, make the application dynamic, B, we can also show that for egress traffic, where a certain protocol is not supported by Istio, for example, in this case, you are using JDBC uh, to connect to a relational database, how does Istio handle it? Uh, this is essentially uh, what's happening in that particular pattern. So essentially what we are showing is that how you can selectively uh, route traffic to different versions of the microservice. Now, if you probably would have seen Book Info many times, but if you don't, uh, Book Info actually gives you a product page which gives you the details of the book. Then there are reviews microservice. There are three versions of it, which essentially are, are reviews of the book. And then finally you have ratings, which are like how many stars this is getting. So in this case, we are showing that we are splitting the traffic 50-50 across the version two and three, and nothing is going to be one. Similarly, if a particular user is coming, we can actually select where to redirect him. Uh, the other thing which we can do is that we can limit the access to a particular destination microservice. So in this case, when we see, uh, we probably want to say that reviews version three doesn't and cannot talk to ratings microservice. So you can actually base, make, make decisions based on that. So now let's look into fault tolerance. Um, and if you still uh, are questioning why we need fault tolerance, uh, because things will go wrong. How many of you were on the rainy street yesterday night? I was like one of these, and I was shivering there, right? So you can't predict things. Things will go wrong. And essentially, before going into this, uh, let me talk about some of the definitions uh, which we will use. Uh, and I want to make sure you know everybody is aware of some of these terms which are being used in the resiliency features. So circuit breaker, and I'm going to read it verbatim because uh, this is a great definition. So the basic idea behind a circuit breaker is very simple. <clears throat> you essentially wrap your function call inside a circuit breaker object. And what it does is, once the failure reaches a certain threshold, the circuit breaker trips so that any other further call to the circuit breaker returns with the error without overloading your protected method. So that's the idea behind circuit breaker. Then we have bulkhead, right? So that's a pattern which is uh, talked a lot about in the microservices uh, use case. Now, essentially, if you see in the industrial world, uh, bulkhead was used in ships or aircrafts actually to partition them into sections. So if a hole does happen in the uh, hull of the ship, in this case, you know, the water will only fill one component or one compartment and the ship wouldn't sink. So that's the idea which is also carried forward into the microservices patterns. Now let's test the resiliency of the sample application, right? So within IBM, we actually have uh, developed a tool. IBM Research essentially is developing. It's in very early stage, but that actually gives you a great visualization whether your application is resilient or not. So it gives you a control panel to inject faults. You can actually inject faults in your sample application and then visualize the traffic flow uh, using the view panel. In the first case, what we see is uh, we actually abort the ratings microservice, which was the last microservice. And in this case, the system is behaving as if the ratings microservice is not available. What we see is reviews microservice is written correctly to come back and just show the reviews if the ratings is not available. But if you actually add some delay, when your ratings microservice is delayed, uh, there is timeout happening. In that case, the application crashes. It is not able to handle and know uh, the reviews microservice just shows that it, it, it's not even able to process and show you the reviews, which is the wrong behavior. So this tool actually allows you to test fault tolerance. And it's actually pulling the data uh, from Prometheus and Zipkin and giving you those visualizations. And you can actually click on the details and be able to see what are the response times, where it is lagging, et cetera. With that, uh, Tommy would give a very quick demo of the sample book info application and this tool. Um, as I said, the tool is in very early stage, um, so if it doesn't work, we do have a recording. We are fault tolerant, and, and then I'll come further and talk about how do we actually handle resiliency uh, in application frameworks themselves, 
and then how does this two handle it? With that, Tommy. Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm going to show you the book info samples and how to use that tool. So for the purpose of this demo, I already have Istio and um, book info deployed on my cluster. So as you can see, like this is a book info page, and you have the details, microservice showing the details, and review microservice showing the reviews. And also the rating microservice will help you uh, help some of the review, uh, some version of the review microservice to show the review stars. As you can see, this free version of the review. This is the version one of the reviews. This is version three of the reviews. And this is version two of the reviews. And right now, I'm going to apply um, Istio traffic routing rules to route all the traffic to version two of the reviews. So I will run the Istio control command. So right now, all the traffic should route to the version two of the reviews, microservice. As you can see, no matter how many times I refresh, um, you will always see like, the review with the black stars. So right now, I'm going to show you the tools. This tool is called Istio Analytics. It's developed uh, IBM internally. What it does is it could apply false injection into the Istio pilot and also help you visualize like some of the traffic using the logging data from Prometheus. So let me apply some traffic to our full info page. What he's doing now is uh, trying to apply some traffic to the sample book info page. So uh, the Wi-Fi is able to handle it. It does take some time right. uh, when the traffic goes and it picks up the rules to actually show you the visualization. Right. What, what it shows right now is um, all the login data for the past 30 seconds from Prometheus. So you can see all the ingress traffic is going to the product page. And product page is calling the details and review microservice to get the details and reviews. While review also call the rating to get the rating stars. So this is the business as usual, right? If everything is working fine. Right. So right now I'm going to abort all the traffic to the rating microservice. So what Tommy is doing here is he is essentially uh, aborting any request which is going to the ratings microservice. And hopefully if it is working fine, if the requests are able to go through will be able to see that the application is written correctly to handle if a particular destination microservice is not available. So the tool does take some time to apply the rules, so give it a second. So as you can see, like for the past 30 seconds, the traffic to the rating is decreasing because we abort all the connections. And we refresh it. As we can see, the review of microservice is good at handling um, 500 set stack code from the rating service, so it's still working fine, it's healthy. However, we apply delays on the rating microservice. What you saw was essentially, you know, we aborted every request to ratings, and still reviews is working fine. So the application right. is written correctly to handle that. Now let's see if we delay the ratings, what will happen to the app? Now I'm going to apply a 20 second delay to 100% of the connection to ratings. So it does so take some. It's adding around 20 seconds of uh, delay time, so it takes around 20, 30 seconds to 40 seconds for the tool to actually, you know, start showing you the results. Uh, but in this case, hopefully, what we will see is that the application is not written to handle that. So what you should have expected is the reviews are still being shown, even if the you know the user ratings, the stars are not available, right? Right, as you can see, the red bars are the error message from review to product page. And you go on the product page, you can see the page is loading because we are having delays, print delays on the rating microservice and review doesn't know how to handle that. That's why it return the file for status code back to the product page. And that's the end of the demo, we give it back to Animesh. Thanks. So we just showed you uh, using this tool, we can actually use uh, resiliency. So we can actually test the resiliency of our application and what's happening uh, versus the traffic. Uh, 
So now some of you may ask, aren't resiliency features already available in application libraries and frameworks itself? For example, uh, if anybody here is using microprofile Java E framework, uh, some of these capabilities should come out of the box, right? And if you don't know about microprofile, as I mentioned earlier, in the, that it's a Java E framework initially based on, based on JAX RS, CDI, JSON E, uh, IBM, Fujitsu, Red Hat, Chavi Chai, Kara, they are all behind it. And there is a strong focus within microprofile around for tolerance. So let's see how do you handle it without Istio uh, from just the uh, microservices framework itself. Right? So typically, uh, what you can do within microprofile is you can actually add all these annotations to your Java classes or Java beans, and it actually helps you to add things like time out, time try, fall back, okay. Uh, for example, uh, you can just add those annotations and to these, and it will start giving you those capabilities. Now, if you didn't have this, typically you would like a for loop like this, like if there is an issue connecting to a service, try it five times. Now, because of this annotation, you can actually you can actually add it directly in the code itself, an annotation uh, to handle if something is not responding, how do you actually try it, when you want to be tried. Uh, similarly, you can actually add annotations for timeouts. So, and you're saying that if there is a delay, uh, then time out after these many seconds. Okay, which is essentially you don't want to overload uh, your service C in this particular case. So what you're saying is that you know only five requests will be allowed, and the rest of the requests can go in the waiting queue. We can okay, we will keep eight requests in the waiting queue. From that perspective, a lot of these capabilities actually come from the framework itself, right? Uh, essentially circuit breaker as well. You can actually essentially create an annotation for circuit breaker and use it. Um, there is also another annotation which is very useful in the microprofile case which is fallback. So <clears throat> yes, things go wrong, things will go wrong, uh, but what do we do if something goes wrong? So instead of uh, doing X, can we do Y? Y. So fallback is an annotation which you can add and in that fallback you can define, okay, if this particular thing is not reachable or it's shining out or it's delayed, Let's do this. So, what happens if we slide this queue into this mix? Now, the application libraries themselves are giving you these hot tolerance features. What we will do, right? So, microprofile gives you a way to actually disable all the uh, annotation based approach. So, even if you have annotations within your code, you can actually set a variable, and by that, you will be able to disable everything else, and this queue will take over in this particular case. Except for fallback. Fallback is something uh, which is more related to the application what you want to do if something goes wrong. Now, some of you might have questions, right? What if both are enabled, right? So, if your application is saying three try tryouts and your student is saying five tryouts, how many tryouts will happen in that case, right? So, in this case, it will be 15, right? But there are policies that timeout after 10 seconds on the application and the student is saying timeout after 20 seconds. What will happen? So the more restrictive will be the first. So again, uh, the reason here we still need Istio in these cases is yes, uh, frameworks which are mature, uh, which are sophisticated, do come with these application libraries. But what if we have a polyglot application? Do you want to rewrite all these four forest features if you have uh, microservices written in Python, Go, PHP? That will be very cost intensive. Istio actually allows you to do it in a generic manner. So you can actually add fault tolerance to your application without any changes to code. So you can create simple things like timeouts, retries with timeout budget, you can create circuit breakers, you can control the connection pool size and request load, you can inject faults. <clears throat> so for example, in this case, right, we can create a policy to show that if there are X plus Y connections, what we are saying is that only X maximum connections are allowed, Y are pending, and anything beyond that should be aborted. So you can create policies regarding this. You can actually create load balancing ejection pools. So essentially, if a particular pod is not responding, you can create a policy to eject it out of the load balancing pool so that any subsequent requests are not being sent to that particular pod. And then definitely you can add uh, timeouts and retries within this particular application. So by default, Istio gives you a lot of HTTP GRPC error codes. It allows you to inject pods. In fact, the Istio Analytics tool, which we showed from IBM Research, that's actually using the coordinated feature of this tool to inject pods 
I show what's happening for the visualization, what you show on the dashboard. And then we also created a pattern uh, which actually goes into the details of it. How do you actually do that? Uh, so you can actually hit that pattern there and Tommy is going to come and show you that pattern. Uh, so that essentially allows you to go step by step and show that how you can apply the circuit breaker, how you can apply time almost, how you can actually use the load balancing detection tool. All these features from Istio you can actually use it. This is a micro profile sample application. This is not the sample book info application. So that, Tommy, I'm going to come and show you. So you go to our um, IBM pattern page to so see like um, these examples. It's um, using Java microservice. So what this example is, is um, it has five major Java microservices it's called speaker, schedule, web applications, sections, and vote. And all these microservices will communicate directly to the Istio ingress. And for the vote microservice, it also uses a cloud and database image to store its voting data. And all of them are running on Istio. And here's the GitHub page of this pattern. And what we're going to show right now is the circuit breaker feature on Istio. And we will use it to um, simulate a load balancing pool ejections. And I also have this example running on another cluster. So once you deploy it, you should be able to see like a page similar like this. This is a sample web conference app where you have speakers, you have their schedules, you can read their talks, etc. Right. So you can vote anything, and you can go to the vote page and see all the voting data. This data is stored in a cloud and database image. So right now everything is working properly, but however, if you want to roll out a new version of the cloud and image, if that's broken, what happens? So right now, let me inject another cloud, another version of the cloud and image. As you can see, the cloud and DB second is our new version of the image. However, it's one more print property, so it would keep. Um, Having file free uh, 500 status code back to the um, web microservice. As you can see, it's not working properly, so it's um, creating error to this um, microservice. So what I'm going to do is going to apply apply this um, circuit breaker rules. What it does is when it detects um, server error from any of the parts, it will eject it from the load balancing pool. So it, we will keep all the traffic only passing to the healthy parts. So, so let me apply an Istio control group. So right now you keep, try to keep booking. So the first time you see the vote is uh, creating error, but after this error, the circuit breaker rule is designed to eject that um, broken image uh, out of the um, load balancing pool. So from now on, every vote you vote is going to be healthy, returning uh, 200 status code. And that's the end of this um, demo. I will give it back to Animesh. Thanks, Tommy. I think what he just showed was enough. Uh, and using a simple SGO policy rule, uh, you're able to eject a service which is not performing uh, out of the load balancing pool, and all of a sudden all your errors are gone. So a lot of these are mentioned in that GitHub repository which was there in that particular case. Uh, so if you uh, do want to try it out, a lot of our development patterns around SGO, around uh, microservices, are actually at that particular link. Uh, the slides are at this particular link. Uh, so I do want to end, uh, end it by saying that let's build reactive microservices, let's build microservices which are responsive, resilient, elastic, message driven. Let's use this team. Thanks again. Thanks for